بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين Oh, praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the choicest of blessings and salutations upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are very honored this evening to have in our masjid and in our community and city uh, a leading scholar in the globe today, uh, none other of course than our Shaykh Faraz Rabbani. Shaykh Faraz Rabbani has wears many caps and has many achievements and has travel to so many different countries but because we don't have time to really get into a detailed biography I feel one of the most important things that we need to know about Sheikh Faraz Rabbani is that he is the founder and the director of Seekers Hub Global and uh, Seekers Hub Global is an international academy and international institute taking care of the needs of hundreds and thousands of Muslims around the globe um, today we have Everyone uses the internet and everyone uses Google and from time to time everyone tries to find an answer or some guidance on the internet and that's very detrimental because you don't know what to find and where to go and many a times members of our community they find weird answers on the internet and they go to websites that are very uh, you know questionable and uh, the service that Sheikh Faraz Rabbani is offering the world is a traditional school, a traditional website, uh, the Seekers of Global website. If you find a question there, you find an answer there. If you have a question, you of course have that peace of mind that you're receiving knowledge from reliable scholars. The Chafaraz of course being the head of the institute from reliable scholars that hold chains of transmission right back up to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thus, uh, amidst so many different types of websites and so many Islamic sites, which are very many a times, like we mentioned, uh, questionable, we have the Seekers of Global website where one can receive clear guidance. And this is one of the greatest services that Sheikh Faraz has offered the world through the Seekers of Global website. Sheikh Faraz, of course, uh, is in Cape Town because he joined the tour of our teacher and Sheikh Sayyidi Alama Al Habib Umar bin Muhammad bin Sani bin Hafid. And thereafter, he uh, honored us by remaining an additional two or three days in the community. Some of the exciting uh, plans that the Seekers Up Global uh, have for South Africa in particular is to host monthly workshops that will be taking place in different parts of our country. And that's one of the reasons why Sheikh Faraz is still around to establish these beneficial programs, not only back home in North America, Canada and uh, the United States, so not only in Europe, but also here in the southernmost tip of Africa, how our Muslims can also benefit from the wealth of knowledge that the Seekers of Global Scholars have to offer. Uh, I'll restrict myself to that much. Um, uh, Sheikh Faraz will be addressing us for uh, approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and thereafter we'll open the floor for questions. So. Uh, Sheikh Faraz mentioned to me earlier that Capetonians tend not to have too many questions. Uh, while the lecture is taking place, I ask of the, the congregation to listen attentively to the advices, but at the same time, if, there's been, if you have a question that has been lingering in your mind for a very long time and you never found the opportunity to present it to a scholar or to a teacher, think about that now and present it to the Sheikh after the lecture. Jazakumullah khair. Fala tafadr السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وسندنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله دي Companions of our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were asked frequently about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the marvels of our Ummah is just as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala honored the, the greatest of His Prophets with the greatest companions. So much so that some of the ulama have when they've asked the question, what was the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ after the Qur'an? 
Enough, and there's many answers to that question. What is the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ after the Qur'an? Some very noteworthy scholars, such as um, Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, one of the great scholars of the 20th century, he said that arguably the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ after the Qur'an was his companions. Right? No other, no other Prophet was granted anything coming close to resembling the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum were described in the Quran kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas and then it is from the tremendous honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with that that best generation of humanity was followed by the next best generation ever granted humanity the tabi'een, the followers. And they, like the companions, were deeply concerned to catch everything they could of prophetic teachings. And many of them went to leading companions, to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, to Sayyidina Aisha as-Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, and many others, and asking them, tell us something amazing about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, routinely responded, that what can I tell you? Everything about the Prophet sallallahu was amazing. Everything about the Prophet sallallahu was amazing. But one of the many amazing things about the Prophet sallallahu that is an important lesson for us in, a, in an age of distractions, and I found during this trip, and I'm guilty like most of you are probably guilty. I found myself several times, even during a recent retreat we're on, that there's four people sitting together. And we're all staring at little devices. Me too, of course. And it's like my mother once, you know, we were, the whole family was gathered in my parents' house. So my father, and you know, we're just chilling out, waiting for lunch, you know, the maqsood al-asli, the main purpose of the gathering. And my father's there following cricket, and if you're a Pakistani, a fan of Pakistani cricket, which I'm not, but my father is. So I find out secondhand what happens, and not much of what happens should cause much joy to a fan of Pakistani cricket. Um, I thought of switching my allegiances to South Africa before the tour happened because I was expecting a slaughter. I actually don't know what happened and I'm not really interested. I'll find out when I get to visit my father. He's going to ask me, so did you see any of the cricket and you know, he knows the answer. The answer is no, but I'll probably check a little bit before I go visiting my father because it's part of Birr al-Walidayn just to be aware of what's going on. So we're all sitting, my father's on one screen. My brother-in-law is catching up with some work on one screen. My brother is updating his Instagram page with a picture of something or the other. And I'm catching up on some work. My mother comes in and says, Why do I have four idol worshippers in my house? In my living room? And my mother walks into the kitchen. My mother says some dramatic things once in a while. So I went, I says, Ami. Why are you calling us idol worshippers? He says, what do idol worshippers do? They keep their idols close to them and they are completely devoted to them. They give their full attention to, to them. I don't like idol worshippers. So my mother usually has a point. I said, so what are you trying to say? Because if you are together, then be together. Human beings are more important. Then these little idols said they even are black like the black stone. Said, well, I didn't, and that's when you don't argue with your parents because technically the black stone isn't you know, quite black. But you know, this kept quiet. I asked, "What's for lunch?" But it was interesting, right? That we get caught up in these distractions. One of the amazing hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu he is described that the messenger in the works of Shama'il. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كان عليه الصلاة والسلام إذا خرج عن من بيته 
غض طرفه إلا عما يعنيه. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم when he left home, he would lower his gaze from everything besides something that was of concern to him. And this is very important because we get so distracted by so many different things. The amount of advertising we are faced with, even innocently, you're walking down the street, there's billboards with advertising. You go into the mall, there's advertising. You do anything else, sound or questionable, and you're surrounded by advertising. Even the food you purchase is enveloped in advertising. Our ancestors, when they bought wheat, do you think the wheat had a packaging that had advertising? No. Whatever they had for breakfast, was it wrapped in advertising? No. But we get wrapped up in all kinds of things. And these things are means of distraction. And then we carry with us the instrument of mass distraction, right? Which is this little, you know, this little smartphone, right? And all kinds of things pop up, right? And I had to like, you know, even though my phone, I keep it on do not disturb mode, but even then, during this, the retreat, I'm sitting right at the front and I don't know how it buzzed. <laughs> and someone said, why are you sleeping? And I wasn't sleeping. I was just closing my eyes. Try, at least that's my view of reality. So, someone's messaging me there. Saying, why are you asleep? Well, if I was asleep, I wouldn't be <laughs> answering your text. But literally, I was just, you know, like three people away from Habibama. And I get text, why are you sleeping? Like, firstly, why are you looking at me? <laughs> Follow the talk. I didn't say any of that. I didn't respond. I, I, I was distracted enough to see it though, which is proof of my being awake. But we get distracted. And then I, he was saying something very interesting. I missed a little chunk of what the Habib was saying. So we have to take this very seriously. That the Prophet ﷺ used to lower his gaze when he left home, from everything besides that which was of concern to him. While at the same time, interestingly, if you look at the description of the walk of the Prophet ﷺ, no one walked with more purpose than the Prophet ﷺ. No one walked faster than the Prophet ﷺ. So much so, that you have to keep in mind, these descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ are from Medina. When he is well into his 50s, hitting 60. Yet the young companions describe, we used to struggle to keep up with the Prophet ﷺ. It was as if he was walking down, he was coming down from a mountain, like a stream flowing down. He's described his walking like it's a ship cutting through the ocean. Right? But yet, وسلم, he walked with majesty, but yet he walked with mercy. Because he wasn't distracted, he would be the first to greet not only adults, but children. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kana Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إِذَا التفتَ التفتَ معاً. When he turned to someone, he would turn completely. And this is not only when he is gathered with them, but even when walking, he'd see someone, he'd turn, face them and give salams. And he would give his attention his spiritual attention was directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But his social attention was directed towards people. As we know from his gatherings, that if someone was sitting with him, they would not imagine anyone else in the gathering being of more concern to the Prophet than that person. Why? Because he was not distracted, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's something that we need to practice. That as believers, our duty is to be present with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Our duty is to be present with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala.
And part of being present with Allah in the world that He has placed us in is to reflect prophetic character and conduct in our dealings with people. And one of those things is that we are present with people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu character, when it is described in the Qur'an as being not merely tremendous, the character of the Prophet sallallahu is defined as being beyond tremendousness. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Truly you are upon tremendous character. So that you have good character, an excellent character, great character, but you have tremendous character. خُلُقْ عظيم. Tremendous character. But even that, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عظيم. That truly you are above and beyond even tremendous character. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This ulama asked the question, what does it mean that the character of the Prophet Sallallahu was tremendous? And here character, while it can refer to how you are with Allah, but primarily khuluq is used on how you are in dealing with your fellow human beings. Many ulama, right from the time of the Sahaba, the great learned of the Sahaba, pondered, you know, what made, what is the tremendous character of the Prophet ﷺ? Some of the Sahaba said it is because he was characterized by all the praiseworthy character described in the Quran. But that describes what the character of the Prophet ﷺ was. Others said that he embodied certain central verses of, of tremendous character, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's saying that Khuzil Afwa wa Murbil Urf wa Arid Anil Jahileen that be easy going, uphold being easy going, Khuzil Afwa. Be overlooking. وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ And command to the good. وَأَعْرِضُ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ And turn away from the ignorant. And many great descriptions were given of what is the character of the Prophet ﷺ in its being tremendous. But then the great Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi was asked the same question. And he didn't answer it descriptively. That what describes the tremendous character of the Prophet ﷺ, but he addressed what is the cause of the tremendous character of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and many of the great Imams of Tafsir took his explanation to explain the verse, Wa inna ala khuluqin azim, and truly you are upon tremendous character. Imam Junaid said, كان خلقه عظيما صلى الله عليه وسلم لأنه لم يكن له هم سوى ربه. The character of the Prophet Sallallahu was tremendous because he had no concern besides his Lord. That what made his character and conduct with people tremendous is that he was moved by one concern which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the little girls that ran in, ran in front of him, he didn't view them as little girls blocking his path. These girls were means of his seeking the good pleasure of Allah, seeking the love of Allah, seeking to be beloved to Allah, seeking greater closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he saw every interaction with creation as an opportunity of dealing with the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the concern that we need to nurture in our life, that when we leave home and practice it by leaving home, but practice it at home too. That the Messenger of Allah when he left home, he lowered his gaze from everything besides what concerned him. What concerned him? Ultimately, he had one concern, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Which is why Sayyidah Aisha describes the Prophet ﷺ took no step nor was ever at rest except remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She also describes, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ عَلَى كُلِّ أَحْيَانِهِ أي في أحواله كلها The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would remember Allah in all his states, in all circumstances. And that's the advice he gave. لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. So his ultimate concern was one, as he himself, صلى الله عليه وسلم, said, من is related to have said, من جعل همه هم واحدة كفاه الله سائر الهموم. Whoever makes their concern one concern, namely Allah, Allah will take care of all their concerns. How? That in every dealing with creation, make it a means of dealing with the Creator. So you're not dealing with the beggar who comes up to you. You are dealing with Allah through the beggar that He has sent to you. What is the question? The question isn't how is the beggar behaving, nor how do you feel about giving or not giving. The question is, what does Allah seek from me? And how do I turn to Allah in this moment that I'm in? Right? Likewise, everything else that happens is an opportunity of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, that may, I am not advocating, and now sadly, you know, the there's these apps called Screen Time, and they now give you weekly reports. I didn't ask for a weekly report of my screen time. And I do my best to use my screen time in ways that serve the good. It's a lot of screen time. I sometimes feel a little bit of guilt. Now I don't check the notification. Right? I, d I lower my gaze because it concerns me. Like, oh my goodness. This couldn't be good for my eyesight. So I lower my gaze. But in all of these things, the question to ask is, is this a means of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this a means of seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this a means of expressing love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expressing those meanings that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this life in reality is a love story between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah has declared, yuhibbuhum, He loves them. The question for us is, do we love Him? Right? The divine call of love encompasses all creation and every moment. Yuhibbuhum, He loves them. But the question is for us, yuhibbuna, right? That do we uphold the quality of those beloved servants of Allah who respond to the divine opportunity of love with love, right? Because what is the quality of the believers described in the Quran? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And those who believe are most intense in their love of Allah. Why? Because normal lovers love once in a while, right? So, you know, at work, you know when someone's recently been married, because suddenly in the middle of work, they look sideways, they have this goofy smile, they're staring out in the clouds. Yeah, he got married two months ago, <laughs> right? And then it kind of wears out, right? Then it's when she bakes a good cake, you love her. When he gets you a gift, you feel love. Love sort of... But true love, right? is inseparable, right? And the nature of the love expressed by the Prophet ﷺ to Allah is at a different level, right? That Sayyid al-Habib Qadim al-Saqaf describes something beautiful, right? That if you look in the books of Hadith, they describe that, the Sahaba describe, we never saw anyone smile more than the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Many Hadiths on that. But he, like other scholars before him, said, why, what, is, what does it mean that he smiled more than anyone else? 
Because most of us, when do we smile? We walk, we see someone, and we smile, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Right? And we're back to our regular routine. But the Prophet ﷺ smiled even when alone. Why? Because he was not smiling at people. He was smiling in... Con- I mean, we can't even begin to imagine the nature of his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali said, لا يعرف النبي إلا نبي. No one knows a prophet in their reality except another prophet. Because what makes a prophet a prophet is revelation. They receive revelation. Does any but a prophet receive revelation? No. Right? So we have glimpses of what it means to be a prophet. That well, they conveyed Allah's revelation to creation, yes. But what is the reality of revelation? That's only truly for a prophet to know. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ would smile even when alone. In contentment with Allah, in love of Allah, in states of faith and certitude and rejoicing beyond our imagination. Right? But this is what is of concern to us, right? Is that when you leave home or when you go back home, what is your concern? Make your concern one concern. Right? So when he left home, this is his concern. But what was his concern when he came back home? No one entered the home more beautifully than the Messenger Wasallam. If he'd been out of the house for an extended period of time, he would brush his teeth before going home. He would send a little child to go and tell the people of his household that he's about to get home, so they could be ready to meet him. Why? Because he wants to make that entering the house the most beautiful possible moment. That's why he kept a comb, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And imagine if you, you know, if when you're entering the masjid, you see a brother stand to the side and look in the mirror and brush their hair. You know, like you'd be like, "What are you up to, bro?" Okay? But no, because he he is seeking the love of Allah subhanahu wa taala in every possible moment, and that's why, as Imam al Busi said, "Jumiat mahasinuhu." فَقِيلَ لَهُ الْحَبِيبُ All beauty was encompassed in him, sallallahu alayhi wa So he was named the beloved. That's part of a poem of his, Imam al-Busiri, the author of the Burda. He entered, notifying his family. He would at the very least brush his teeth. He'd keep a siwak with you. And that's a practical sunnah that you should not neglect. Imam Abu Hanifa said that the siwak is from the sunnahs of our deen. Because there's no limit to the circumstances in which it's encouraged to use the siwak. And you can't really, most of us would probably not be able to use a toothbrush and toothpaste before entering your own home. He would greet the people of the household. He would pay attention to them. All these sunnahs, what drove the sunnahs of the Prophet is that one concern, which is the concern for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really... The one question to ask in life, right? That what does Allah seek from me in this moment that I'm in? There's a an aphorism of Ibn Ata'illah al Sakandari that I found very confusing when I was still in university. I'm not sure I still understand it. These are deep words, but it's been a long time. I hope I'm beginning to understand some of it. He said that the fool, the ignorant person, al jahilu, the foolish person or the unaware person, let's put it in politically correct terms so we don't feel bad, like I don't feel bad, right? That the unaware person, when they wake up, they wonder, what am I going to do today? But the intelligent person, al-aqil, when they wake up, they wonder, what is Allah doing with me today? And there's many layers of implications in there. I don't claim to to have understood all of it, but at at the very least, one layer of meaning of this, 
that the ignorant person, the unaware person, when they wake up, they wonder, what am I going to do today? Of course, there's many people who don't even wonder that. They just slip into their routine in autopilot. They don't even think, what am I doing today? Right? Or why am I doing it? But the intelligent person should ask the question, oh, what, am I, what am I doing today? In the story of life, you don't matter that much. Allah matters. Right? So the question to ask is, what is Allah doing with me? And what does He seek from me in the moments that I find in my life? And that's it. And if you see everything as being from Allah, there is no such thing in life as a problem. Right? Even the most difficult situations are this, the same question applies. What does Allah seek from me in this circumstance that I'm in? Whether I did well or I messed up, where I succeeded or I failed, whether there's ease or difficulty, it doesn't matter. It is all from Allah. And the opportunity is, how do I respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this? Which is why, and we'll close with this aphorism of Ibn Ata'illah, he says, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ الْعَطَاءَ فِي الْمَنْعَ صَارَ الْمَنْعُ عَيْنَ الْعَطَاءَ if you, if you can learn to see Allah's giving when He withholds from you, then the withholding itself becomes from His giving. Why? Because even if you lose something, you wanted to marry Zubaydah, but she married someone else. It's like the sister emailed, said, I'm devastated. Because what happened, she, she wanted to marry a particular brother. And she wanted to talk to her father about approaching him. She consulted her best friend. That he's so good. So her best friend went and directly proposed to the brother. Within two weeks they were married. And then she asked me, what do I do? I wanted to say, it's all done. <laughs> right? Because they're married. What are you going to do now? It's like checkmate, right? So, but you have to learn to see things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then ask yourself that question. Right? That, what does Allah seek from me? in these moments that I'm in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us awareness and understanding. And we'll close with one of my very favorite hadiths. And everything about the Messenger وسلم, is amazing. But in the works of Shama'il, including Shama'il of Ahmed Tirmidhi, it is described that a child of the Prophet وسلم, was brought to him on the verge of death. And it wasn't his own daughter, but a granddaughter of his, an infant. And he held this infant against his noble chest. And the infant breathed her last and died against the chest of the noble Prophet ﷺ. And Umm Ayman started crying. So the Rasul ﷺ looked at her and said, Ya Umm Ayman! مَا هَذَا الْبُكَاءِ O oh, Umm Ayman, what is this crying? And she, had, she was crying profusely. And the hadith commentary says she was probably making noise while crying as well. So she looked at the messenger size. I mean, she's an older lady at that time. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, أَلَسْتُ أَرَاكَ تَبْكِي O oh, Messenger of Allah, do I not see you cry? And he had tears coming down his noble cheeks. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with tears coming down his noble cheeks, هذا ليس ببكاء. This is not crying. Meaning it is not like your crying of dejection and loss. إنما هو رحمة. It is but mercy. It is but mercy. Truly the believer is in all good in all states. The believer may be facing death, yet they are content and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because that's what life is about. Every moment in life is a declaration of love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can respond with love. 
and that moment is absolute perfection. Or we can respond in disappointing or distracted ways. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the responses of true lovers, of those whom Allah has described. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Strive for beloved responses to the moments in life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the responses in life, the choices in life, the actions in life of His most beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose only concern was His beloved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we fall short, may we have the sincere repentance of His most beloved servants, of those who are oft repentant, who hasten to repent and rectify and return to the ways of true lovers. Wasallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira wa barakallahu fikum wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Yeah, so sometimes the question is that the difficulties we have in life can be prolonged difficulties, extensive difficulties. It's not a momentary annoyance or harsh, momentary hardship, but it can be something that lasts a long time and it can be a difficult burden to deal with. So, yeah, I mean, one thing is to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have created man, we've created the human being in toil and struggle. It's not that toil and struggle just happens. The whole of all of life is one big tribulation. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ Allah has created death and life to intensely try you. So all of life is a tribulation. The difficulties are a tribulation, but usually the ease is a greater tribulation. And if you ask our elders, if you see 10 people who go through difficulties and 10 people who have worldly ease in life, who suffers more in their deen? Typically, the people who, do, who seem to have it easy suffer much more in their deen. Why? Because in difficulty, we all know that we need to turn to Allah. Right? But when things are easy for people, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa tells us in the Quran, most people are not they don't respond with the gratitude that is required. But when we deal with difficulties, there's many things can be mentioned, but there's four practical things to keep in mind. One is that one of the most important sunnas that we should not ignore is the sunnah of consulting. The sunnah of consulting. That we are all affected even in a land like this, by the, this modern sense of individualism. I can do it. I can deal with it. I can handle it. I can tough it out. Have mercy on yourself. Consult. Right? Consult. That things may look very difficult, but if you consult, you realize that there are ways of... How can you respond in a worldly sense? But also, how do you respond in a spiritual sense? So consult those worthy of consulting, both in the worldly aspects of things and in the spiritual aspects of things. This is a critical sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. From first thing he did after revelation came, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was he went and consulted Sayyidah Khadija, al-Kubra, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Throughout, you know, the great events of his life are punctuated with consultation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's a sunnah that a lot of people, they have some difficulty. So who have you talked about, who have you talked about this with? Nobody. That is one great mercy. Another great mercy, and your community has a lot more social linkages. And that's why, when, if I'm sitting here and I'm looking at your faces, Overall, you guys look so much less stressed than people do when I'm sitting in Toronto or maybe it's the Cape, Cape Town lifestyle because in Joburg they do look a lot more stressed <laughs> and they don't laugh quite as much. But you know, Alan Payton said, the world doesn't need a second Johannesburg. One is enough. 
one of my favorite lines from Cry the Beloved Country. And I only experienced it more when I went there. Although it's a nice place, but one is enough. Um, I wish there was a lot more Cape Towns, but Alhamdulillah. But the sense of community, the Prophet said, Al Jam Alikum Bil Jama'a wa iyakum wal furqa. Be with the group. And I've asked many scholars, you can translate jama'a as community. Because a community is people who come together with a common purpose. Right? Be with the group, meaning be with community. وَإِيَّاكُمْ furqa, And beware of going alone. And one of the big mistakes that people make is when they're going through a difficulty, they sort of just... And it's related to the first one, they sort of go alone. No, when you're going through a difficulty, that's when it's most important to be with community. To be with family, to be with your friends, to come to the majalis of ilm, to the, come to the majalis of dhikr, come to the congregational prayers. Remain connected. Don't just bottle these things up. These are social aspects that are very important because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ قَرِيبٌ مِنَ الْوَاحِدِ Right? For the shaitan is close to the one alone. Because you're dealing with the difficulty and that's difficult enough. You don't need to deal with the difficulty plus shaitan. Right? Because the shaitan comes in and starts giving you all kinds of confusion. The shaitan doesn't like the group. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ قَرِيبٌ وَالْوَاحِدٌ The shaitan is close to the one alone and is more distant even from two. مَنْ أَرَادَ بُحْبُوحَةَ الْجَنَّةِ فَلْيَلْزَمِ الْجَمَاعَةِ Whoever seeks the sweet scent or the vast expanses of paradise, let them hold fast to the group. So these are three social sunnahs, right? Consult. Keep good company. Right? Keep good company. I forget what the third was. But consult and keep good company. Stick to community and the sources of mercy that are social. Thirdly, turn to Allah in need. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in need. Right? Reflect. Right? And see that your difficulties are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too. And the question is, you can't do anything about the difficulty. You can't choose. There's no pause on, on reality. You can't say, pause, let me go back and pass the exam. You failed. Now thinking about, I failed, won't make you pass. The question to deal with, what, how do I respond to this? Right? So reflect. Right? How do I respond to this trial? Sometimes there's things you can do. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Right? And that's when you turn to Allah in dua. I spent th three years, nine months, legally blind. I could see but fuzzy. I could only read from a tablet. And I had some retinal surgeries and funny things. A confession, I don't know what the retina is. I know it's something in the eye that helps you see. Or without which you can't see. I don't know. But I figured out that once I had my retinal issues, my learning about the retina won't help me heal. Right? The healing is from Allah. The worldly means is the, the doctors. So I had some of the best doctors in the world. We have good doctors in Canada. I did not find out anything about that. I, my responsibility was to go to the appointments, number one. Number two, to do what the doctor said. Or to do what my wife said, who made sure I did what the doctor said. <laughs> right? That's what I had to do. My, the day before one of my major surgeries, my wife said, find out what the surgery is. I said, it's got a big scary name, I don't need to know. I focused on what I have to do. Which was nothing. Right? I'm... The surgery was not a participatory experience. They're not saying, give me this you know, scalpel, do this. I'm just sitting back and being operated upon. So sometimes our difficulties are like that. My wife said, watch this video. I said, I don't want to get stressed. She, said, she turned it on in front of me. I watched the first 50 seconds. I wasn't paying attention. I was just saying, subhanAllah, walhamdulillah, 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 walhamdulillah. Like, what am I going to do with this? They're cutting up your eye, doing this stuff. Big deal. At the end of it, it'll either work or it won't. If it works, great. If it won't, like getting upset about it, it won't change anything. So sometimes difficulties are like that. That, you just... It is what it is. It is what it is. 
what you can do something about, do that thing. If you can't do anything, do what you can do, which is a lot. So, you know, and then there's a, there's a Bedouin sheikh in Jordan, when people used to come to him with their life trouble. He said, he used to tell them, وَلَيْ هِمَّكْ أَصْعَبْ شَيْءْ أَوَّلْ مِئَةْ سَنَةْ He said, don't worry. The most difficult thing is the first hundred years. Okay? And once you get to Jannah, inshallah, this, this life will be like the blinking of an eye. So when you blink, it's like, you know, there's something falls in your eye, you blink a few times, it's gone. Our life here, you blink a few times, and it's gone. Right? In the meantime, stay focused on what matters. Right? Any other questions? What, so we're in an age where information is so re readily accessible. Um, what's the importance of sahba when seeking knowledge? One is, most things you should ignore. Right? Um, one of the thing, useful things that the ulama suggest, many righteous ulama in our time suggest this, if you follow the news, do one thing. Right? If you watch half an hour of news, write down what are the stories that came by. Right? How many of those were important? Right? And how many of them weren't? The fact that a, an elephant slipped in Thailand and two people died, we have whatever, seven and a half billion people on earth. Every day, a few people die and a few people are born. That's life. Like, did you cause the elephant to slip? Are you responsible? No. Can you do, they died. Can you do anything about that? No. Right? A lot of the information is like that. You can't do anything about Other things you already know. Right? Like we have this morbid interest that, oh, another 2,000 people have died in Syria. Are, do you know people are dying in Syria? Yes. Do you need to know how many are dying? No. Right? So a lot of the news is really a type of informational entertainment. Most of it you can ignore. If you want to find out what's going in the, on in the world, news is not the way to find out. Read. Read to understand what's really happening. And not, don't read conspiracy theories, but ask learned people, ask wise people, what should I learn to really understand? The fact that Israeli soldiers have killed another innocent young Palestinian child. Guess what's been happening for 70 years? Right? So what does it do? It, it, all these things, Allah SWT tells us in the Quran, it's to make the believers feel down. Right? So you want to find out what's going on in Palestine, the news won't tell you. Right? Find out. But then consider, what, are, what am I supposed to do to respond to what's happening? If you watch news, there's three basic adab. Right? Besides, of course, watching the right kind of news. One is, if you're watching with concern, watch with intention. Right? Which is, you have nusr. You want to draw closer to Allah by having concern for good for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. You should watch the news with intention. Number two, you should be making dua. It is disgraceful for the believer to find out that there's trouble happening. That there's people who don't have access to water somewhere. They're like, oh, that's so bad. And start doing all kinds of political analysis that so-and-so is corrupt and so-and-so is this. Did you make dua? No. Right? Number three, to ask, in all of this, what am I supposed to be doing? Because you sit through half an hour of watching what's going on around in the world for things you're not responsible for. Are you a corrupt member of some government? No. Did you cause the water crisis in Cape Town? No. But what can you do? That's what you need to think about. What can I do? Not only my life, but what can I do to be a, a source of benefit to Allah's creation? Right? And if all of us did one thing, cut out all the news in your life, if you watch half an hour of news a day, that's three and a half hours of news a week. Spend that time in some khidmah, in some way of benefiting people. And the ways of benefiting are many. You'd be an agent of good in this life. Right? Suhba is a part of that. That if you want to accomplish something, be with people who have that concern. So if you're in, in, serious about seeking knowledge, it's a basic, one of the 
many things that you need along with high intention, etc., is choose the right company. The early Muslims would say, based on a hadith of the Prophet, لا تسأل عن المرء واسأل عن خليله فإن المرء على دين خليله Don't ask about a person, how they are, but rather ask about their close friends. For a person is on the religious way of their close friends. It is very difficult to climb a mountain alone. Right? And anything worthy of pursuing in life is like climbing a mountain. It takes time and consistency and effort and there's dangers on the way. And you know, so if you want to be a student of knowledge, find people who are serious about seeking knowledge, but also serious about acting upon that knowledge. وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And be with those who are true. And they say, وَكُلُّ مَنْ سَارَ عَلَى الدَّرْبِ وَصَلْ All those who tread a trodden path reach the destination. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. That The questioner asked that I listen to uh, an answer about the istikhara, presumably on the Seekers Hub global website. And how does, and that the scholars talk about having, after the iskhara, having an, an inclination towards what is, what appears to be good, um, as a number of scholars mentioned. But how does one know that if one has doubts and misgivings? One thing is that while it is not uncommon, because Allah is merciful and generous, that if one makes istikhara, you might get a dream or might get a vision or you might get some clear sign, etc. The answer to the istikhara is contained in the dua. That the dua of istikhara is basically saying that, Oh Allah, you know and I don't know. Okay? You're aware and I'm not. You are able and I'm not. So if you know this matter to be best, better for me, in my deen and my dunya, short term and long term, then destine it for me and bless it for me. And if this matter is harmful for me in my deen and my dunya, short term and long term, then turn me away from it and turn it away from me and destine the good for me wherever it may be, then make me content with it. So how does one decide on the istikhara? Based on that framework that you ask yourself, what choice appears to be better for me in my deen and my dunya, short term and long term? Directly and indirectly. And then you make that choice. And then, and then once you make the choice to have the certitude that because you have asked Allah, Allah will manifest the good for you either in the choice that you made, in the way that you wanted, or in whatever other outcome that happens. For example, when people get married, and we have elders here, sometimes the best thing that happens to someone is a failed marriage. I was gone for 10 years, when I went overseas, I had just finished university. I got married, final year of university, went overseas. All my friends got married either before I went overseas or in the subsequent years. Came back 10 years later, the people who benefited the most in the deen were people who had bad marriages. Why? Because they turned to Allah. So you never know what's better for you. Many of them got remarried and it became really good for them. Right? So you don't know what's better for you. So that's the, the decision-making framework. That the, the inclination is towards what appears to be good for you in your deen and in your dunya. Now and later. The istikhara is coupled with consulting. If someone has waswasa, consult. You don't have to make every decision in life. I'm stuck in a situation where, where I'm responsible for an international organization, the most difficult decisions I have to make, I have a very simple policy. I co consult some of the senior scholars, depending on what kind of issue it is. In North America, I, I reach out to Imam Zaid Shakir. Imam Zaid, we have this difficult decision to make, has to do with practical community decision. What do we do? Nine times out of ten, what, whatever he tells me, I'll just implement. And I've consulted someone more learned and more wise and more experienced than I am. And you simplify your decisions in life. Don't try to figure it all out on your own. If we have doubts, consult. If you're not convinced by one answer, we know from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, seek another answer. It's qalbak. Seek an answer from your heart, 
even if people give you answer after answer, you know, till your heart is addressed, this, seem, this answer seems right. But of course, at the same time, don't over ask. One of the sunnahs of asking is ask till you don't ask too many people, because you'll be confused. Ask five people, they'll give you four different answers. Right? So you find out people you trust and then listen to them. Right? Listen to them. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to grant us ease and facility. Um, and the only way to deal with waswasa, one of the great imams of the Hanafi school, I know you, a lot of you are Shafi'i, or most of you, but to have Imam Shafi'i, Imam, one of the great Hanafi imams mentioned in a gathering in a place like this, at least sometime, Imam al sarakhsi said, As-sabilu fil waswasati qat'uha wa adamu l-iltifati ilayha. The only way to deal with misgivings is to cut them off and to pay no attention to them. So if you've made a decision, now the minister of disinformation, shaitan comes, says, what if, what if this? How about that? Once you make it, ignore the devil. Ignore the devil. Don't listen to the waswasa. You know where it's coming from? Pay no attention to it. Simple. So when you incline towards something, stick to that. You don't have to reason with the shaitan. He's smarter than you are. Just keep walking straight. Lower your gaze from all that does not concern you. The shaitan is of no concern to you. So ignore him. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us turn to him and turn away from all else. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.